Okay, so uh, today we're diving into John Carmack. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, John Carmack. <laughs> Doom, Quake. Legend. The guy's a coding legend. But here's the thing that always kind of throws me. Okay. He's got this quote. Uh, I'm going to try to get it right. Go for it. He said, uh, we have a ridiculous amount of people and resources, but we constantly self-sabotage and squander effort. I have never been able to kill stupid things before they cause damage or set a direction and have a team actually stick to it. Mm. And it's like, whoa. This is the guy who made some of the most successful, right. uh, most influential games like ever. It's kind of jarring to yeah. you know hear that kind of bluntness. It is interesting because on one hand, you have this incredible technical vision, right? A guy who thrives in this world of game development, which is very collaborative. Oh, yeah, for sure. Big teams. Yeah. But at the same time, he's clearly frustrated with yeah. like the bureaucracy, yeah. the things that come with teamwork. Yeah. And large projects, which is kind of what you have to have to make these big games. And to get to that, we need to, like, rewind all the way back to the beginning. Okay. To, like, young John Carmack. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, weren't there stories about him breaking into his school to steal Apple II computers? Yeah, that one's actually true. With Thermite. It's a great story. I don't know if it's quite as dramatic as sometimes it's told. (laughs) Okay. They did... uh, they did want to liberate some Apple too, yes. But uh, uh, I oh, think yeah. it did not go as smoothly as planned and the police were involved. Not smoothly. I think he ended up in juvenile detention. There might have been a little... It's dedication. A brief stay. <laughs> Although, maybe not the best role model moment for all the kids listening out there. Right. Thermite. <gasps> Probably not the answer. Probably not. But you can see that even back then, he had that drive. That like willingness to take risks... To get to what he was interested in. Totally. And you wonder if those early experiences kind of shaped how he sees bureaucracy. Right. And those stupid things. Right? Yeah. Like maybe they do get in the way of actual progress. Yeah. Like he's always got this internal engine that's just raring to go. And those early experiences probably just fueled that. Yeah. And it leads him to Soft Disk, okay. a small software company. Right. And that's where he meets John Romero, Adrian Carmack. Some names that, if you know, you know. Yeah, the future founders of Aimwide right there. Exactly. The core raid team comes from Mm. that. And what were they doing at Softest? They were making these, like, educational games and side projects. Right. Right. But you could see where things were headed. Yeah, you could see those early seeds of what would become Doom and Quake. Totally. I mean, Carmack was already pushing the limits of what you could do with the computers back then. Oh, absolutely. One of his early innovations was uh, something called Adaptive Tile Refresh. Okay. Now, that might not sound... I'm sure it's fascinating. Well, it was a big deal then because it basically made scrolling smoother. Oh, okay. In games. I can see how that's... You know, might seem small, Mm -hmm. but back then, huge. Right, right. It was a big deal. It's like laying the foundation for everything that came after. Exactly. It paved the way. And then you get Wolfenstein 3D. Oh, man. Which is a whole other... Game changer. Literally. Level. Yeah. Because now you've got this fast-paced action. Right. And these pseudo 3D graphics. Yeah. And it's like, for a lot of gamers, it's the first time a game really felt immersive. Yeah, like you're actually in there. And you can thank Carmack for that. It's all him. I mean, he was relentless about pushing the technical possibilities. It's amazing. And then, of course, Doom. it wasn't just a game. It was a whole thing. It was everywhere. I still remember when it came out. It was like this cultural explosion. Exactly. Yeah. And a huge part of why it was such a phenomenon was Carmack's technical brilliance. Oh, yeah, for sure. He came up with this thing called Binary Space Partitioning, or BSP, which totally changed how game levels were designed. Okay, gotta be honest. I've heard of BSP, but, like, explain it to me. Like, I'm back in my dorm room trying to figure out how to beat the next level. Okay, so picture this. You're trying to make a 3D world on a computer that's way less powerful than your phone. Right. BSP was like this elegant hack it let developers break down those complex levels into smaller chunks. Okay. Which meant they could build these huge detailed environments that didn't make the game crawl. So it's all about efficiency. Totally. Wow. He really was squeezing every last drop of power out of those machines. Oh, absolutely. No wonder people called him a magician. (laughs) But here's the other thing about Carmack. Okay. This is a guy who was famous for working crazy hours. Yeah, the stories are legendary. Like 60-hour work weeks? Are you kidding me? Is he even human? He'd probably say it's not about the hours. It's about the focus. He's talked about getting into this, like, flow state where he can just really sink his teeth into a problem, not just working more, but working differently. 
Right, right. Like the stories about his coding retreats. Oh, yeah. Disappearing to some hotel, no distractions, just him and the code. It's kind of wild. Intense, right. Yeah. But that tracks with his whole thing about bureaucracy slowing him down. It's like anything that gets between him and the code is just dot noise. Totally. Like a high performance engine that needs those perfect conditions. But here's the thing that gets me. Immortal. What's that? This is a guy who made his name on these huge commercial games. Doom, Quake, all that. Exactly. But then he turns around and becomes this huge advocate for open source. Yeah, kind of goes against the grain there. A little bit. So what's the deal with that? It's about the free flow of information. Carmack believes that knowledge should be shared. That's how we get real innovation. Mm -hmm. Interesting. He even called patents robbery once. Oh. Yeah. He sees them as holding back progress. Wow. Strong opinions. He's got them. But the best part is, he doesn't just talk the talk. Let me guess. He open-sourced some of his stuff. Oh, yeah. Wolfenstein, Doom, Quake. He uh -huh. put it all out there. Are you serious? Good That's man. amazing. Imagine being some young programmer, right? Getting to see the code behind Doom, figure out how it worked. Talk about a master class. Exactly. What a gift to the gaming community, really. Absolutely. But we got to talk about the rockets, right? Oh, yeah. We can't skip the rockets. Because making games wasn't enough. This guy decides to jump into rocket science. It's classic Carmack, though, isn't it? Taking on huge, complicated problems. From Ferraris to freaking rockets. It's pretty wild. He needs those challenges, the stuff most people wouldn't even attempt. And it's not like he was messing around. Oh, no. Didn't his company win that Lunar Lander Challenge? Twice. Twice. Which tells you something, right? Yeah. The guy knows how to solve problems. No doubt. Whether it's making a game run on a tiny computer or designing a spacecraft, he brings that same intensity. Totally. Which, I guess, leads us to his latest thing, AGI. The big one. Stepping back from Oculus to go all in on artificial general intelligence. It's like he's taking on the final boss of tech challenges. <laughs> what do you think it is about AGI? Okay, but uh, before we go any further with, like, why Carmack's doing this, right. we should probably define AGI a little bit. Yeah, for sure. For those of us who don't spend our days writing code. Right. What are we actually talking about when we say artificial general intelligence? So AGI is basically about creating machines that can uh, think like humans do. Okay. And I know that sounds like kind of sci-fi. It does. But think of it this way. Okay. A lot of the AI we see today, it's really good at one specific thing. Right. Like uh, playing chess. Yeah. Or translating languages. Right. Even writing marketing copy. AGI is different. Okay. It's not about being the best at one thing. It's about having the flexibility to learn. Okay. And adapt to any problem you throw at it. Just like humans do. So instead of building a machine that's amazing at chess... We're talking about a machine that could learn chess. Exactly. And then go write a symphony. Yeah. And design a building. And maybe even make a few jokes along the way. Well, we'll see about the jokes. Okay, fair enough. But that's the goal. It's replicating how our brains work. Like and that's why it's so hard. Yeah. It's like we're trying to reverse engineer the most complex thing we know of. Right. It's not just about some fancy algorithm. Yeah. This is like recreating the human mind from scratch. Pretty much. Okay, so now I get why Carmack's so into this. Right. It's the ultimate challenge. Yeah, it's like if you're John Carmack and you've kind of conquered everything else, where do you go next? Exactly. And remember that quote about stupid things? Oh, absolutely. I bet AGI seems like a field that's just full of them. You're probably right. And that's got to be appealing in a way. It's a field that's still kind of wide open. A lot of potential for someone like Carmack to come in and shake things up. That's like the Wild West of tech out there. <laughs> but it's not just the challenge Yeah. if this actually works. Things could get really interesting. That's putting it lightly. What kind of impact are we talking about here if someone actually cracks AGI? I mean, imagine a world where we have machines that can think as well as humans. It's kind of hard to even imagine. Right. Like, they could be working alongside scientists, curing diseases. Yeah. Helping engineers design sustainable energy. It'd be revolutionary. We could solve some of the biggest problems we face. But there's the flip side, too. Oh, yeah, for sure. What are the ethics of all this? Are there risks we haven't even thought of yet? Those are the million-dollar questions, and there aren't easy answers. It's exciting, but also kind of terrifying. Totally. It's like we're on the edge of something brand new. And who knows? Maybe the guy who created Doom yeah. will be the one to lead us into the age of thinking machines. It's a wild thought, right? <laughs> From those early games to something that could reshape the world. That's John Carmack for you. Always pushing the limits. 
Well, that's about all the time we have for today's deep dive. Big thanks to everyone for listening. Until next time, stay curious.